Philippine Senate rejects charter change Kasabon efforts. Kasabon na agad ang pirma. Bakit hindi nila... Retired Supreme Court Chief Justice Hilario David Jr. Another framer of the 1987 Constitution is turning down. Philippine congressional leaders say they will pursue charter amendments next year, even without the Senate's participation. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Maingay sa ere, pahayagan at social media ang bangayan ng Kongreso at Senado patungkol sa paraan sa pagbabago ng 1987 Philippine Constitution. Sa kabilang dako, patuloy ang kontobersya kung sinong nasa likod at nagpupondo sa pagkukolekta ng pirma para sa isang People's Initiative. Why are some sectors like the Catholic Bishops' Conference, Catholic Educational Association in the Philippines, UP political science professors, among others, wary of charter change or cha-cha. This is not the first time the national leaders attempted to change the 1987 constitution. All administrations after President Corazon Aquino proposed changes. There were proposals to shift to a parliamentary system, lift term limits of elected officials, amend restrictive economic provisions, and shift to federalism. But none of these attempts succeeded. So we ask, will this recent move to change the constitution prosper? Or perhaps the better question to ask is, why should we care about the Constitution? In this afternoon's online forum organized by the Philippines Communication Society in conjunction with TVUP, we will try to understand the context, issues and concerns, and the implications of what is perceived as a sinister move of self-centered politicians to change the Constitution. Welcome to Cha Cha Cha, Mga Indayog at Ritmo sa Pagpapalit sa Saligang Batas. I am Mike Navalio, your moderator. We're streaming live on YouTube at the TVUP channel and the Facebook pages of TVUP and the Philippines Communication Society. We are also being cross-posted by the Facebook pages of the Philippine Political Science Association, the USD Journalism Society, and Press1.ph. And we're also viewed on TVUP Signal Channel 101. We'd also like to acknowledge the help of the... Well, we are streaming live courtesy of... Uh, the Philippines Communication Society and TVUP, but we would also like to acknowledge the help of the following to make this forum possible. We have TVUP, Philippine Political Science Association, and the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines. For those who are registered via Zoom, we will soon be sending your certificates of attendance through email. Now, if you are interested in joining PCS and its relevant projects, uh, here's how. And before we officially start the discussions, the Vice President of the Philippines Communication Society, Dr. Leonor Hernando, will deliver the welcome remarks. Magandang tanghali po sa inyong lahat. Ikinagagalak po namin ang inyong pagdalo at pakikiisa sa napakainit na usapin ngayong hapon. Para po sa inyong kaalaman, ang Philippines Communication Society ay isang samahan ng mga guro, professionals, researchers, at mga practitioners ng media. Ang aming pong organisasyon ay ang pinakamasasabing matanda o nauna na naitatag sa lahat ng asosasyon ng komunikasyon kasi kami po ay tinatag noong isang libo, siyang naraan, walong putpito o noong 1987. Bilang mga guro, marami na po kami napagtapos sa mga dalubhasa sa komunikasyon. Gayun din naman, meron din po kaming publikasyon mula noon hanggang ngayon kung saan naitala namin at nasuri ang mga kaganapan sa ating lipunan. Kami po ay mga advocates para sa malayang pamamahayag at pagbibigay ng balanseng impormasyon. In the in the interest of discussing relevant issues among academicians and communication practitioners, 
PCS or the Philippines Communication Society in partnership with TBUP and some media organizations has held a series of webinars on artificial intelligence and several election related topics. The latter dubbed as the National Forum on Communication and Democracy, Philippine Elections 2022, was recently awarded during the 20th Wheel Awards under the category on Issues, Management, and Crisis Communication. Ito po ang aming pinakabagong nakamit na karangalan. Ang ating pong usapin ngayong hapon ay sadyang napaka-importante para sa atin bilang mga mamamayan ng Pilipinas. Ang ating pong saligang batas o konstitusyon ay ang pinakapundasyon ng batas at galaw ng ating gobyerno. Ang, na, ang pagpapalit nito ay mga ngahulugang magbibigay din ng pagbabago sa ating nakasanayang ekonomiya, politikal, sosyal at mga nakasanayan ng gawain at karapatan. Kaya tayo po ay tumutok sa ating programa at alamin ang mahalagang usaping ito. Kaya balik na sa iyo, Attorney Mike. Thank you very much, VP Lenny, for stating the relevance and importance of this discussion to our Philippine democracy. Chartered change, otherwise known as cha-cha, is befittingly likened to the dance cha-cha. Cha-cha is a dance rooted in Cuba, described as a fun, flirtatious dance with playful energy. That's from the website called dancingforbeginners.com. Now, like in the cha-cha dance, the partner, or voters in this case, are lured and charmed to sign a petition to change the constitution by dangling welfare funds. Meanwhile, the squabbles between Congress and the Senate connote the playful energy between dance partners. In a dance, cadence and timing are important. If there is a misstep, it ruins the beauty and fluidity of the movement. It disrupts order and it brings about chaos. Thus, today we will dissect the issues on charter change and provide a better understanding of the political, economic, and legal context, alternatives, and implications of changes in the 1987 Constitution. Sa atin talakayan po ngayong hapon, Susubukan natin masagot ang limang katanungan. Ano nga bang saligang batas? Gaano kahalaga ito sa demokrasya ng bansa? Bakit marami ang nagtangkang baguhin ito pero hindi naging matagumpay? Totoo nga ba ang mga nakasaad sa Article 12 on National Economy and Patrimony ng 1987 Constitution ay hadlang sa pagunlad ng bayan? Napapanahon ba ang pagpapalit sa ibang parte ng saligang batas? At pinagkakatiwalaan ba ng bayan ang kasalukuyang kongreso sa pamamaraan sa pagpanday ng di umano'y mas makabansa, maunlad at mas realistic na provisions? Now joining us in this discussion are three well-respected experts. To discuss the political context of the Constitution is a political science professor from UP Diliman and she is a member of the Philippine Political Science Association, Dr. Jean Encinas Franco. Dr. Franco, good afternoon. Magandang... Hapon, Mike. Uh, magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Uh, thank you for joining us and I'd like to uh, thank um, the Philippine Communication Society and the Philippine Political Science Association and the organizers of this uh, very important webinar uh, for inviting me. No? Okay. Good to see you, Dr. Franco. Now, to dissect the arguments of Congress on the need to amend the economic provisions is the former Undersecretary of Finance and UP Economics Professor, Dr. Shello Magno. Professor Magno, welcome to the program. Uh, good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, discussion. All right. And we are also fortunate to have one of the framers of the 1987 Constitution, a lawyer who was once the Comelec chairperson and a founder and honorary chair of an election watchdog, the Legal Network for Truthful Elections, or LENTE, Attorney Christian Monsod. Attorney Monsod, good afternoon. All right. So let's begin our discussion this afternoon with Dr. Franco. Give us a sense, Dr. Franco, of just how important the Philippine Constitution is and What's the position of the Political Science Department of UP with respect to this proposed charter change? Dr. Um, Dr. Franco. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Um, I would uh, like to read uh, the position of our department, which was also presented uh, in a hearing in uh, 2022 in the House of Representatives. So um, this is our um, 
statement, historically, Philippine initiatives to change the constitution were made to break from the immediate past and usher in a new political order. For instance, the 1935 constitution provided the transition and vision of a post-American colonial regime in the Philippines. The 1973 constitution institutionalized man rule. The 1987 constitution dismantled the dictatorship and offered solutions to heightened social injustices that authoritarian rule had engendered, furthermore institutionalizing democratic checks and balances across the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government, as well as civil society's power in relation with the state. Simply put, the overarching change envisioned in the current constitutional reform process must articulate the nature of the break that is it wishes to achieve. It must also be crystal clear that the problems the charter revision wishes to address cannot be done through regular legislation and or executive action. Our people need to hear from the political leadership answers that are based on grounded and evidence-based claims. Our people deserve no less. While constitutional amendments may not require any special historical moments, revisions in practice were usually undertaken after some major upheavals like revolutions, coups, post-colonial wars, democratic uprisings, post-peace agreement managed transitions, or after a regime change, such as when left-leaning governments were elected into power in several Latin American countries. Since 2016, several proposed resolutions in both chambers of Congress, including those favoring the federal shift or a charter change, claim that there is a quote-unquote public clamor for the shift or change. Opinion polls belie this. In a September 2022 Pulse Asia survey, charter change was not in the list of urgent national concerns. Any attempt to amend the constitution or change the charter requires prior consultative and deliberative processes involving a genuinely informed citizenry. The claim that there is public clamor for constitutional change remains unsubstantiated to this day. The realities of the fiscal and logistical demands required to roll out credible and substantive processes to change the constitution make it an even more problematic pursuit, especially in the face of more urgent and immediate local and national problems. We also humbly remind our honorable decision makers that constitutional change is not, is not the silver bullet or the holy elixir to cure our country's problems. It is not a panacea to remedy our socio-economic ills or the only means to accomplish our national desires and aspirations. Reforms can be accomplished through an appropriate mix of legislation and policy interventions and not simply through constitutional amendments or even institutional overhaul. Existing laws can be reviewed and amended and processes and practices safeguarded and improved. In fact, economists argue that the policy framework of the Philippines is already liberalized enough with legislation already in place. Um, these, Mike, um, these are just uh, excerpts from our um, statement because uh, the statement is quite long. But let me end, and this is uh, my own take. Um, if we observe current de developments, the way I see it is that the process seems to be a done deal therefore drowning the voices of those who oppose it because of the way the process is being fast-tracked and, if I may say, railroaded. My sense is that those who oppose charter change must already prepare to launch a campaign against it in the run-up to the plebiscite. So thanks. This is all for now. We'll be happy to respond to questions and comments later. All right. Thank you, Dr. Franco. And just a reminder for our viewers that you can send your questions through the if you're on Zoom, you can send it uh, through chat, or if you're on our social media pages, uh, we are now being cross-posted on CIAP, UST Journalism Society, Press One at PH, and Philippine Political Science Association. You can send your comments there, and we will try to read your questions uh, to our resource persons later on. So now, one of the issues that has been raised uh, to justify uh, changing the constitution has been supposedly for better economic prospects for the Philippines and whom better to talk about this other than Dr. Shelo Magno, who was with the administration, and she is now with the UP School of Economics. Dr. Shelo, can you tell us about the truth about the proposed economic amendments? Uh, thank you, Mike. Let me share my uh, uh, screen. 
uh, and uh, give a quick presentation on a uh, charter change and FDI. No? Maybe let me start with uh, let me start with why why we want FDI. So of course, maybe it, this is based on the literature. It can increase productivity, facilitate transfer of technology, reduce um, unemployment. It can improve human capital, improve capital flow, and of course, it can create a competitive market. But we also have to understand, because now the way we package FDIs is it's like a silver bullet. This is the only missing uh, link, not to our economic growth. But we have to understand that in the development economic literature, there are also concerns on why even with FDIs, we do not see growth in economies. And this is what we call threshold externalities. So based on the literature, it says that developing countries need to have reached a certain level of development in education, technology, infrastructure, and health. In emphasize po dito na hindi sapat na nag-attract lamang tayo ng foreign direct investment. We need to develop these sectors to make sure that we really benefit from the growth in, in, in the sector. Without high level investment in human capital, we are not gonna see rapid growth from FDIs, okay? There's also this tendency that FDIs can crowd out domestic investment, meaning that lumili et, instead, because now the thinking is, oh, we need additional foreign direct investment to augment the current domestic capital that's available in the market. And, Based on existing literature, FDIs can actually crowd in, meaning naga add nga siya, but it can also crowd out domestic investment and it can be neutral. And it's because of the various types of FDIs in a country. And I think these things, the need to invest in human capital, the need to understand what type of FDIs we need to attract in the country are important conversations that the administration should be doing to be able to attract FDIs. Okay. Um, at the same time, there's also a discussion if you want to attract high-tech FDIs. It's important to address technology gap. Sometimes an FDI would come in partnering with the domestic sector, but it doesn't mean that the whole business sector would benefit from it. So we have to make sure that while we're attracting high-tech investment, we are also addressing the technology gap between domestic enterprise and foreign investors, okay? So clearly, I want to look at the global context of FDIs, and we are, we are seeing here a decline in available foreign direct investment flow. So what does this mean for us? It means that the sector, the demand for FDIs becoming more competitive. Countries have to be competitive to be able to attract FDIs. And to put uh, the Philippines in context, we see that uh, in recent years, FDIs in the country is declining and it's the lowest in the region. Um, so it's important to unbundle these. What are the factors that foreign direct investors consider to be able to locate to a country? And this is based on existing literature. We know that quality of institutions, rule of law, quality of human capital, infrastructure, macroeconomic conditions, trade policy, state of technology, tax policy, and market size are important. But again, I go back to sa sinabi ko kanina that there, there are different types of foreign direct investments. No? And the effect of these variables vary on the type of FDIs. For example, market size. Market size matters to FDIs who are seeking where to sell their product. Okay? They are not meant to produce and export their product, but they come here to be able to sell, sell to us as consumers. Those types of FBIs will not be uh, concerned on what tax incentives we should be giving them because these companies are the ones which can actually crowd out domestic investment. Kasi iko compete niya yung, ano eh, diba? yung, yung market natin. And then at the same time, of course, state, state of technology, the ones who are concerned with high tech, sila yung may concern dyan. So, hindi siya one policy fit all in attracting FDI. So the government has to clearly sit down and think of what, um, where we're going to focus, what sectors are we going to strengthen to be able to effectively attract FDIs. Now, the question on whether to liberalize and uh, reduce regulatory restrictiveness of the country to be able to attract FDIs. Kasi ito yung pinag-uusapan. Are we very restrictive? I want to point out, kasi ito yung dinidiscuss palagi sa Kongreso kahapon, yung FDI Regulatory Restrictiveness Index of OECD. And they keep on mentioning that the Philippines is one of the most restrictive, restrictive economy. 
But they're citing 2020 data. Nakalimutan ata ng Kongreso na sila ang nagpasa ng mga batas ng 2022 that are significantly liberalizing our economy. Nevertheless, some studies, specifically Parkon et al. 2021, this is the latest. They've looked at the importance of restrictiveness in terms of attracting foreign direct investment. And this one is a quote from their paper. Mix yung findings nila. So they did a robustness study um, to examine really what's the effect of uh, restrictiveness in terms of attracting FDIs. And this is what they said. It's statistically insignificant for all investors when we talk about macroeconomic stability, quality of governance, ease of doing business, and quality of infrastructure. Okay? But nevertheless, sige, let's look at the constitutional provisions and the current policies that we have. We have a constitutional provision on natural resources, but this has been addressed by a Supreme Court decision. For example, in mining, mining allows 100% foreign ownership already. This is based on the 2001 Supreme Court decision, the Labugal uh, Bilaan versus Ramos. The recent DOE circular amending the IRR of the Renewable Energy Act, classifying renewable energy as not natural resources and therefore no limitations in terms of 100% foreign ownership for renewable energy sector. On land, we've already discussed this. Vietnam doesn't allow land ownership too. Our policies are similar, but this provision in the Constitution also allows Congress to elaborate further on how we're going to use our land. So we have this RA 7652, the Investors Lease Act, Act, which allows the leasing of private land for 50 years and renewable for another 25 years. That's already a lifetime. No? Ang importante sa land, yung well-defined property rights, which will allow you how to utilize the asset that's assigned to you. On foreign investment, again, the Constitution has provision limiting foreign uh, capitalization of 6040, you know, but that provision also gives Congress the power to further define which sector should be limited based on the interest of the Filipino poll. And then and because of that, we have RA11647, again, updated 2022, where the president is given the power to issue a negative list. For the information of the public, even China has negative list, and yet it's able to grow its economy. Okay, these are the, the, the negative lists in the executive order of the president, but again, the remaining uh, sectors are the ones we classify as public utilities under the Public Service Act, mass media, education, and advertising. With respect to practice of profession, the limitation is based on existing laws, whether we have treaties with other countries, or we have rep 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 reciprocity policy. Okay, that's my last slide. Just to summarize, I think we should focus on human capital, institutional quality, infrastructure, clear policies on how to implement all these laws and rules that we have, clear implementation of rule of law. And I think the government has to have a strategic framework on what FDIs we want to bring to the country. Apologies for exceeding my time. But uh, if you have additional questions, you can contact me through this uh, channels. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Magno. And, and just a reminder, of course, you can still ask your questions uh, to uh, Dr. Magno. I see some comments on the chat and some questions. Uh, so we will tackle that later on. But uh, in the meantime, let's now talk to attorney Christian Monsard, a prominent legal eagle who told hard in framing the 1987 constitution. What's his take? Uh, is are the current moves to amend the Constitution actually legal? What can we expect out of this? Attorney Monsod? Attorney Monsod, I think you're still on mute. Yes. I was going through through my papers and I realized uh, that uh, Shell and the uh, uh, first speaker have already covered most of the things I was going to say. So I'll, I'll stick to the part that uh, uh, that I made, uh, you know, about the constitution, um, and and say that the immediate trigger, by the way, when you talk about EDSA, was the elections before uh, on February seven. Now, <clears throat> when uh, when uh, many many people call EDSA a revolution. But the Davide Commission, of which I was a member, that investigated the seven coup attempts called 
it, people power revolt because it is unfinished business and part of the unfinished business has already been have, have already much of it have already been mentioned by the previous speakers was that but EDSA was not only about the restoration of democracy it was also the promise of a new social order that remains unfulfilled through every administration since EDSA and those of us who are turning government owe an apology to the youth, uh, especially of this country, especially those from the poor for that failure. The fact is that put up our nation to greatness at ETSA and after we accomplished in 1992 elections, the first peaceful transfer of power in 27 years. We folded our banners, we put away the t-shirts with the imaginative slogans said about humor at the times and we went back to our personal purposes and advocacies and we went back to, to, as we went back our separate ways with our separate causes we lost something of a dream of a nation and the significance of our interconnected lives this is why we are in bad 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 position today also today we are still the laggards in our part of the world on mass poverty and inequality that are rooted in a federalistic system of political dynasties and its companion evil corruption. According to the Lucent report to the UN, the Philippines was among the worst countries in handling the pandemic. Today, today, this is the context of now of this uh, uh, proposal to amend the constitution. And I'd like just to our people to be cautious about this. Today, we are already on a slippery slope to authoritarianism under the coalition of dynasties of four presidents, Estrada, Arroyo, Duterte, and Marcos. Our system of checks and balances is weakening. The rule of law, it's also mentioned by Shell earlier, the Europe rule of law is on a decline and the index of corruption is increasing. We have a Supreme Court that deferred to President Duterte on the issue of the sufficiency of the factual basis of martial law, uh, so that now martial law can be declared anywhere and anytime in the Philippines. Then the Supreme Court for Campos went uh, deferred to the president on uh, on uh, Senator Laila and on the removal of uh, Chief Justice Serrano. And then there's the impunity of the extrajudicial killings in the anti-drug campaign and the creation of pork barrel system for the executive for contingency intelligence and so-called public purposes. Money that should be should be doled to help the poor. A recent study, however, and this is bad news, by the Cambridge University of the, on the Supreme Court on 70 mega cases and the voting record of 86 Supreme Court justices from 1987 to 2021 showed an average voting pattern of about 69% in favor of the government the appointing power. But Duterte appointees voted 96, 94% in his favor. And today, 13 of the 15 justices are appointees of Duterte. But of course, there are also golden moments in the life of the, of the of Supreme Court. We are here today to ask why the Constitution is being blamed as the hindrance to foreign direct investment, which they say is the key to higher growth rates with all its benefits. Blaming the Constitution also exploits the surveys that 73% of our people know nothing of Constitution or very little of it. And, that, and that's why I want to give a brief explanation of the constitution that they want to change. EDSA was the inspiration of the 1987 constitution. It was the first time that we spoke to the world as a truly independent and democratic Filipino nation. It is a document that had not been imposed on us by a colonial power or by a dictatorship. In our national consultations before we started, the people, we listened to the people. And they prefer the stability of familiar structures, democratic representative presidential system with checks and balances and separation of powers. And that's, we'll bring that up as an issue also on this people's initiative. 
overwhelmingly the people wanted to vote directly for the president. There are a num number of provisions in the 1935 and 1973 constitutions that are in the 1987 constitutions. But the, the three most important themes of our constitution, and this will apply also to why we cannot, we cannot uh, allow changes in our constitution. First, the heart of the constitution is social justice with the poor as a center of our development. It was called by the president of the Constitutional Commission, former Justice Cecilia Munoz Palma, as the heart of the new constitution. Hence, the new article on social justice to address not only mass poverty, but also the gross social, economic, and political inequalities that is rooted in a fidelistic system of dynastic families that has been impervious to change for generations with the corruption that goes with it. The compelling principle is encapsulated in the last sentence of Article 13, Section 1, and I quote, by equitably diffusing wealth and political power for the common good. And I will go over the proposals and see that it violates many of these provisions. Second, second central theme, never again to any authoritarian government, hence the strict limitations and conditions for declaring martial law and new provisions in the Bill of Rights to protect citizens against the abuses by the state. And third theme of the 1987 Constitution, the national destiny must firmly and safely rest on Filipinos themselves. Never again amendments similar to the 1935 Constitution that gave Americans equal rights to our patrimony and economic publishes where even our exchange rates after independence could not be changed without the approval of the United States, which resulted in the foreign exchange crisis of the early 50s. The 1987 Constitution also cut the umbilical cord of our previous Constitution to the United States Constitution. The U.S. Constitution gives primacy to civil and political rights because it's a country of immigrants who all started from the same position and only wanted to be free from autocracy. Hence the emphasis in the United States on individual rights and a market economy. Our constitution gives social and economic rights equal primacy with civil and political rights because we are a country of inequalities from the colonial days to the present where the starting positions of the rich and the poor are not equal. Therefore, when you look at social justice, Social justice is really about the adjustment of the starting positions before we foster the market competition with such development paradigms as, well, it is enough to provide equality of opportunity and a fair, uh, and a fair process without being too concerned about outcomes. And rising, they say, well, rising waters raise all boats, forgetting that many boats are crammed with people many without food, amid the luxury right yachts of the rich. That is why social justice provisions are even included in the article on the economy. Article 12, section 6, the use of property bears a social function and all economic agents shall contribute to the common good. And I, I emphasize this, subject to the duty of the state to promote distributive justice when the common good so demands. To fulfill the vision of a new social order, the state should engage in income distribution programs, primarily quality education and quality health care, and four asset distribution programs for the poorest of the poor, agrarian reform, urban land reform and, farm and, and housing, ancestral domain and fisheries reform, where the poorest of the poor are. How can the young, how can I, and I am referring to this because one of the provisions they want to amend uh, is the education. How can the young of the poor compete for career and business opportunities with children of the rich when the quality of their education and health care are not the same? I accepted to speak yesterday to the to a school, uh, uh, Filma, and uh, and told them I'm surprised at the remarkable where they have many branches now. And I, I, I said, I look forward to listen to you, to the young, on, on 
on their experiences and what they intend to do for the country on for the quality education they are going. Because at the end here, we will say, how will we change things, right? Because many things wrong with us, our, party, our, our policies and our, our weekend, uh, weekend institutions. With regard to the asset reform program, I will not go through all of them, but let me mention only agrarian reform. That uh, as, as, as they are all underperforming, all of them, because they are either underfunded, <coughs> agrarian reform, sorry, was supposed to get 225 billion over 20 years, but got only 175 billion, or with loopholes in the in the in the in the laws on by this distribution of shares instead of land like of Ashenda Lucita of the Cuancos, which was finally ended by the Supreme Court in 2014. We argued for the farmers and the farmers won. As for urban land reform and housing, local governments can sell their lands to rich land developers with commissions, of course, instead of using them for housing for the poor to save them four hours of heavy traffic to go to work. And indigenous peoples used to own all the land. They were driven to higher ground by our colonial masters in complicity with cacique landowners, where they are now facing mining companies who are not only given access to our minerals to, <laughs> without any value given to the raw materials, but are also given forestry and water rights. The proposed mining reform bills to change, uh, address all this uh, in the mining uh, reform bill to change that and also environmental externalities, as uh, as our previous speaker said, the externalities of mining. And what happened? The mining company killed the mining reform bill twice under the Aquino and Duterte administration, even at, at the community level. It never even got to plenary. And they were very proud about it. He said, it's easy money. Why? Because our Congress, and this is part of the context of why I don't think we trash trash Congress, because our Congress is very adept at transactional legislation, uh, and uh, like uh, uh, that's that the they're not only politicians but also the rich in our country are very adept at that. I hope this introduction to the content of the Constitution will urge you to study it and to devote time and whatever career the young. I want to to, uh, to pursue uh, with especially the provisions on social justice, local autonomy, and the Bill of Rights. The Constitution is not the problem. It's very part of the solution. By the way, what are the people being told on the purpose for amending the economic provisions? And only the three, right? Education, uh, public utilities, and advertising. And this I get from the farmers. Uh, I'm chief legal counsel for five national farmer groups and for some urban pool people. What are the people being told? The people are being told, and I quote President Marcos in an interview last January 23rd, quote, the 19F7 constitution was not written for a globalized world. We have to adjust to it so that we can increase the economic activity in the Philippines and we can attract more foreign investors, unquote. This is the same president who, <clears throat> who last year said, uh, uh, for me, I quote, for me, all these things being talked about, we can do without changing the constitution. Uh, Shell was correct. We have already done that. Our constitution proves to be re resilient because, because of all the things that have been done to say we are now open to business. He, the president, after all, is the chairman of NEDA, which came out about September 2022, the Philippine Development Plan uh, for 2023 to 2028, approved by the president as chairman of NEDA. That's time that the country is quote unquote open for business. And I think she already mentioned all of all of these things that have been done to, to 
that is cited as open for business. Attorney Mansoad, yes. Thank you so much for that. Um, if you don't mind, we will have to proceed to the next part If uh, unless you have some very important points you want to uh, to raise. One example. One example. One example. Go ahead, Attorney Mansoad. Here is the example of the Japanese manufacturing companies leaving China about four years ago who put the Philippines as destination number four behind Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. When the Japanese Chamber of Commerce was asked why, since manufacturing in our constitution is allowed 100% foreign ownership, there was much discussion of the pros and cons, quality of manpower, also like that, and also uh, 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 manufacturing chains, infrastructure, and so on. But what was the most important, finally, factor against us? And I quote, they said, country image. That's what they said. Which they said was they tried to change but could not. A big part of that image was, of course, corruption, including transaction legislation, which would open the door wider by the essential of that phrase, unless otherwise provided by law in the economic provisions at which corrupt politicians and greedy big business are very adept. I was once asked, and this is my final word in this, that, you know, how you, did you make mistakes in the Constitution? I said, of course, because the Constitution, because the, the writers were imperfect. But I think, right from hindsight, that we made two mistakes. We under we overestimated the spirit of EDSA, and we underestimated the greed of politicians for power and of the rich for more wealth. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Munson. Of course, we will have more chance to listen to Attorney Munson later on in the program. We have an interaction with the reactors, and we also have the Q and A uh, for our viewers and other members of the audience. Now, to further enlighten us or seek further clarifications about the issues on Chacha, we have invited educators to react to the presentations of our distinguished resource persons. To react to Dr. Jean Franco's presentation is the president of the Philippine Political Science Association and UP political science professor, Dr. Jan Robert Go. Dr. Go, you have three minutes. Hi, thank you, Mike. Uh, I, I would not have any negative thing to say about Dr. Franco's uh, uh, statement because uh, I basically signed the same statement because we're part of the same department. But uh, I would like to point out two things. Now, the first uh, is in terms of the process of amending or revising the Constitution. Um, if, if what they are saying is that they would just like to to change certain provisions, then that's a uh, amendment. We're, we're basically amending the constitution. But the question there is, um, what's the process being undertaken? And I think if, uh, if people, especially those in Congress right now, particularly the House of Representatives are trying to fast track this without uh, sufficient uh, consultation, no? and just uh, assuming that since they are uh, district representatives, they have the direct power to, uh, overhaul or change certain provisions of the constitution, then probably there's something wrong about that. Um, because changing the constitution is not just uh, uh, on the powers or in the hands of the Congress no, or of the House of Representatives, but more importantly, uh, I think the people should be involved in the process of identifying which ones should be amended, which one should be revised, and the process should involve the people. So basically that's one. The second one is the question of changing, amending, or revising the constitution itself. Um, constitutions are institutions, written institutions. Um, so we are basically talking about how the state, the government will run, will be formed. Uh, and therefore, it only presents to us one part of the equation. Constitution is just one part of the equation. The other part of the equation are the people who occupy the political offices. So we have a framework. The constitution is a framework. And we blame the framework as if the framework would be the one that is uh, the, 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 the source of the problem. Or on the other hand, we see the constitution as the one that will solve all the problems. We, we should not look at the constitution in that manner. Rather, we should look at the constitution as the framework that will help those who occupy political offices to uh, implement or to execute certain other specific laws. And therefore, 
Uh, if the problem is in terms of uh, yung mga sinasabi nating uh, poverty and all of that, corruption, these are human factors. And I think the Constitution can only give us so much. The human factor, therefore, should be the one we should be seeking to address. The politicians who are corrupt, the dynasties who are entrenched. Okay, And therefore, how we look at the, this question of constitutional change should not just be uh, looking at the question of changing which provisions of the constitution, but rather if we look at the entirety of the political system and uh, also try to blame those who are implementing these provisions, who should have made our lives better from the very start. Yeah, so that's my intervention intervention here. And I, I think um, uh, we'll be okay. Yes, Dr. Go. Thank you. Um you emphasize in your reaction the importance really the people who are running the show, so to speak, who are occupying political offices. And for Dr. Franco, she was saying earlier that this is certainly almost a done deal uh, from all indications based on those who are sitting uh, in power. And you have the president now saying that uh, he confirms that he wants the charter change plebiscite to be done simultaneously with the 2025 midterm elections, saying holding it separately will be costly. He just said that now. Uh, from your um, analysis of what's going on, is the president all in behind this charter change? Is it limited to just the House Speaker wanting his amendments to the Constitution to be introduced? What's your reading of the whole thing? Why is this happening now? Dr. Franco? Yeah, my sense is that the president was just convinced no, to take this on. Remember this, he categorically said during the 2022 uh, campaign that he was not for charter change. He also said that there are more urgent matters to to um, address. So, I mean, in uh, less than a year to his term, uh, he already he already said that um, he's uh, for uh, uh, charter change, specifically amending the economic uh, provisions, no? Sorry, less than two years to his term. So um, um, that's very different compared to previous attempts to, to change the charter where uh, the presidential impetus was there from the very start, specifically in contrast with the Duterte charter change uh, proposal, which was his uh, campaign promise. Um, so... Um, and uh, we're now seeing that the president already bought uh, into uh, the issue. He's very much involved now, um, even talking to both houses of Congress. And that's, uh, I must say, an, uh, a weird uh, turn of events. No, um, So, yeah, um, um, let's just uh, wait and see. But as I uh, said, um, I mean, the the... A uh, problem with um, uh, combining the plebiscite with uh, 2025 elections is that it might muddle, once again, more important issues because that would make the uh, constitutional change proposal to be the number one issue come 2025 elections if they're combined. But of course, I understand that they're also concerned with the cost. But if they're concerned with the cost, then why bother to change the constitution when the economy say that there are uh, enough uh, laws and safeguards already? Mm -hmm. Dr. Go, you agree? Yeah, I agree because uh, I think the issues that are more important, especially if we mix the plebiscite with the uh, midterm elections. The, the, the issues that are important that should be raised for the midterm elections will be eclipsed, will be overshadowed by the discussion on the constitution uh, and changes in the constitution. And therefore, we are basically clumping all of these issues together. And I, I think no, I think there, there are more important issues. For example, uh, the pandemic has just been has just ended, but we're still feeling the uh, the impact and the effects of pandemic. So how, how do we grapple about that? Uh, I think these are important issues that also has to be raised. But then we are busy with the uh, issue of constitutional change, which might not be directly associated with the you know, with the livelihood, with the you know the things that are closer to the tummy of, of the people. Yeah. And Dr. Franco and Dr. Uh, Dr. Go, 
To what extent do you think this moves to amend the constitution now, the timing of it, and the context? How is it affected by the ongoing squabble supposedly between the Marcoses and the Dutetes? Is this a, a proxy war of sorts that this is one of the battlegrounds? Um, what's at play? What's the bigger play here? Well, um, go ahead. Well, I think the the Dutertes are just uh, riding into the anti-Chacha movement, if I may say so. And, you know, the the weird thing is that they change their mind, like their, <laughs> their minds and their statements, like they change uh, their clothes. So it's it's uh, difficult to, to believe anything that comes uh, from the Duterte's mouths. No? Dr. Go, before we proceed to another part of a program. Yeah, uh, I I more or less echo what uh, Dr. Franco said no, about about the Duterte just riding this anti cha cha thing, but but I guess it only reveals that the unity that was there before is no longer united anymore, and uh, that's just bringing all of this cracks uh, coming out. And uh, I guess that if 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 this comes to the point that we really have to decide, then it's going to be chaotic in some form. Not necessarily violent or bloody, but chaotic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, final note, no, just curious. The fact that they had to go through a people's initiative to determine how Congress, how Senate, and the House will vote, uh, they want the vote to be joint, and that's the, the only question in the people's initiative. Is that indicative to you, or what does that tell you about um, the power balance now in, in the Senate and in the House? Very quickly. Well, I get yeah. the, the the fact that they had to go through that is just because they wanted to manufacture, quote unquote, the a the sense of public clamor, and mm -hmm. the fact that it was not transparent. We were we just woke up January twenty twenty four, and then there's this uh signature campaign tells us how they really want this to be uh fast tracked. No, yeah, mm -hmm. that's can I, can yeah. I, can yeah. I just comment something about it. All right, go ahead, Dr. Mas uh, Dr. Masad. Yes. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the House uh, has a long list of charter changes they've been passing for the past year. Right? They have a long, I have a long list of it. And they tried to go to the Senate to get a two-thirds vote of the Senate for a constitutional convention. They could not get it. Mm. Uh, then they went to the House, to the Senate again, uh, for a three-fourths vote on a constituent assembly, they did not get the vote either. That's why the People's Initiative is their last card in order to to do the process. And and uh, some of the, them are still all going. I just talked to a group in uh, in uh, in Manila, some Palo group, and so on, and they told me that they are still doing it. Um, mm -hmm. If the implication of the so-called compromise agreement between the Senate, the House, and the President was that it is going to be the Senate who will lead any changes to the Constitution, and the Senate said, well, but only on three provisions, economic provisions. And if you go through those three economic provisions, uh, they're really not necessary. You know, as I already explained uh, earlier. So... Mm -hmm. And 13 billion, yeah, if the privacy. So now they're talking about uh, 23, uh, 2025 uh, to, to do it, to do three small, rather meaningless changes in the constitution. Don't feel me, right? The president has been mm -hmm. lying about this uh, since the, since the, uh, since the elections. Yeah? Uh, I think the lady said it. First, he said that mm -hmm. it. Then he said it's not a priority. Then he said, then he said, I do not want to interfere with the house. It's an independent agency. And then finally, he said we, he will study it. Did, did he study mm -hmm. the, the Philippine Development Plan that mentions nothing about charter change in order to achieve its objectives? The seventy-three billion dollars of pledges he got from abroad. Did any of them? have a condition for charter change, none. So uh -huh. the, the deal, it seems uh, behind all this is that the charter change is going to be much bigger than we thought. 
uh, it was going to be, and they're mm -hmm. going to they're going to include a plebiscite uh, in the in the uh, elections in in 2025. So I mean, let's not kid ourselves on this. The the, the right. signs are so obvious. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Attorney Mansad. Dr. Go, would you, would you like to say something before we move on? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much. All right. So now to react uh, to the statements of uh, Dr. Shalom Magna earlier, we now have with us Professor Felipe Salvosa II. Um, he is a PRO of the PCS and head of the journalism program of the University of Santo Tomas. Uh, he will be reacting to Dr. Magna's statements earlier. Uh, Professor Epe, go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon to... Um all of you in uh, in the zoom room and all of everyone watching on youtube and on facebook and the different pages who are cross posting our live stream today uh thank you to uh professor magno for your dissection of uh the proposals to amend the economic provisions of the 1987 constitution um i think every time the discussion of changes in the constitution crops up the 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 discourse becomes almost too predictable. No? So uh, every time Chacha comes out, there's always uh, talk of, um, you know, they're doing it because uh, politicians want to extend their terms. No? So I think one aspect of the 1987 constitution that's um, really uh, done uh, the work of um, keeping uh, politicians in check is the single six-year term limit of the president. So when a president is out of power, he is really out of power, as we can see uh, in the case of uh, our former presidents, including President, former President Rodrigo Duterte. Um, they cannot come back. There's no more coming back. Uh, so term extensions. The second one is whether we will do it by uh, con as or con con, meaning to say... Uh, and then when we talk about con us, is it going to be voting separately or void voting jointly? Uh, so these are the common discourses that are always cropping up when it comes to cha cha. And then um, these uh, th these discussions are always predicated with um, proposals to uh, confine the amendments to the economic provisions, no? Uh, as if uh, amendments to the economic provisions carry automatically uh, pure and good intentions for the Filipino people. So I think uh, Dr. Magno is right that we need to examine the motives and the implications of um, the economic provisions that they want to amend. We need to question the basis and the premises of these proposals. Um, for instance, uh, uh, the passage of amendments to the Public Services Act during the Duterte administration undermines their argument that the goal is to increase foreign direct investments. As we have seen, uh, the amendment to the, the the amendment to the Public Services Act now allows hundred percent ownerships, hundred percent foreign equity ownership in. Uh, sectors like telecommunications. No? Um, of course, there are a few remaining sectors in our constitution that are close to foreign direct investments, and that includes um, mass media and education. Although if you look at mass media, um, what was the intention for blocking off foreign equity in mass media? Uh, at that time when there was no internet no social media and cable tv is not that prevalent i think the and the uh, Prof. attorney monson could validate this the the intention was to prevent uh, um foreign uh, foreign agendas not to cloud the uh, public discourse in the philippines no as we have uh, as we can see uh time has uh, the passage of time has rendered that uh, provision of the constitution almost ineffectual because right now Filipinos are bombarded with uh, foreign content you know, from uh, foreign uh, news organizations. The CNNs and BBCs of the world are easily accessible to Filipinos. Uh, but then again, we have to 
we have to consult all of our stakeholders. Is it a good idea to allow foreign equity in mass media? Maybe not one, maybe not one hundred percent, but what proportion uh, of foreign equity should be allowed in mass media? Because we should also look at the experiences of other countries. For instance, in Poland, uh, one of the problems there is that mass media is controlled by the superpowers that are uh, that sandwich Poland, no Germany, for instance, and Russia. So the Polish are consuming mass media that are influenced by the superpowers, no, that are you know, colliding in that uh, sphere, no. So we have to we have to ask, uh, we have to we have to discuss this. What kind of foreign equity? What is the proportion of foreign equity that could be good uh, for sectors like mass media and advertising that will allow these industries to innovate, to reinvest? And perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, ameliorate uh, the level of compensation uh, in, of workers in these industries. Um, I think um, Professor Magnus' uh, reaction to one of our guests here is instructive. No, that in, even in industries like mining, where uh, ownership of FTAAs uh, is uh, can be one hundred percent foreign owned. It can be one hundred percent foreign equity. We have not really benefited from uh, mining as a result. So that is uh, an, a valid issue that we should uh, reflect upon. Uh, to wrap things up, um, what I'm going to say is nothing new. So this cha cha process, I would say, is too important to be left in the hands of politicians. I agree with Attorney Monsod and the other. In, uh, other resource persons that we should um we should uh, be more consultative you know and we should listen to the wise counsel of our bishops who said that um people's initiative should really come from the people rather than from self-interested politicians thank you thank you professor salvosa and uh professor salvosa touched on this but i do want to ask uh, professor magno dr magno about those uh, industries which are still 100% Filipino-owned. We still have a negative list for them. For example, the media, as Professor Epet said, they have education, um, land ownership. Um, is there not any argument in support of allowing uh, foreigners to come in? Or is there really a good reason to keep them out? For example, if you're concerned that lands can suddenly be owned by, for example, Chinese trying to come and flock to the Philippines, or trying to control the media, what's the logic for these provisions and what's your take on allowing uh, foreign ownership for almost all, or in fact, all our industries in the Philippines? Is that a wise move? Yeah, I, I think one primary reason why we have restriction is also a concern for um, national security. Okay, Other countries mm -hmm. have restriction and that's why it's 60-40 because it has to be Filipino controlled, especially for sectors that are very exposed to uh, foreign intervention. For example, di ba madalas natin pag-usapan yung National Grid Corporation of the Philippines mm -hmm. and the, uh, how risky it is that, that China has a significant investment in that sector. Imagine allowing foreign a foreign uh, company uh, owing, owning the distribution of water in the country and then all of a sudden we had a conflict with that country. The bad. Mm -hmm. They have a control of the quality, access to water, etc. So national security is a big consideration. I have no objection in terms of liberalizing the mass media sector. But the question is actually, as Professor Salvosa already pointed out, the sector is experiencing competition already because of evolution in technology. And the mm -hmm. exit of CNN showed the, the degree of profitability of the sector. So opening the sector... Uh, does not guarantee entry of investors in the sector because we have to look at the, whether it's still profitable or not. With respect to education, of course, I fully support the liberalization and the entry of foreign universities in the country. But the uh, immediate question uh, before us is that we have limited resources. We have to mm -hmm. allocate them. We have to prioritize. Are we really going to go through this process of amending the Constitution just to allow 100% uh, um, university, uh, foreign-owned universities to be in the Philippines. With respect to the education sector, I think our problem is how to improve basic education. 
and the amount mm. of money that we are allocating in the education se sector is very small compared to other countries, including Vietnam. Uh, in Vietnam and India, the way they improve the education sector is not by relying on foreign universities coming into their country, but actually providing support to their students to study abroad and then come back and invest and grow their IT sector. On land ownership, uh, we can look at Singapore experience. They're allowing foreign ownership of land, and now they have an issue in terms of the increasing price of uh, real estate property and access of mm -hmm. Singaporean to uh, real estate property. Uh, but then going back to, again, the issue of FDI, is it, the, is it really a constraint, the land ownership? And we have seen in the literature that it's not an issue. And the Vietnam experience is an example of that. The investment in Vietnam is significantly higher than investment in the Philippines, and yet they only allow leasing and not ownership. So those are my uh, concerns with respect to the remaining items that have not been liberalized. Mm -hmm. Professor, your concerns about these remaining items, which are still not liberalized, you did mention something about the media earlier, uh, but what about the other provisions, but for the other industries that still remain 100% Filipino-owned? Which of them do you think can be opened for an ownership? Which ones should remain 100% Filipino-owned? I don't think there are still uh, provisions or specific industries that are limited to just Filipinos. We are open to partnership. Some tech sectors allowed 40% in the executive order of the president. There are varying degrees of ownership. And as I said, the basis for, for that is one, um, in terms of the national security risk, there are prohibitions in the constitution, which we have identified already the, the four sectors. And then, I mean, other strategy with respect to prohibition would, would um, factor in the differences in the types of FDIs. Uh -huh. It's not that we don't allow 100% ownership, but for example, if a company would locate to the Philippines, an, an FDI, but the reason why it's locating is so that it can sell its shampoo to the Philippine market, you don't really just open up and say, come here and we'll give you what? A seven-year tax holiday, don't pay corporate income tax, right? You know what's going to happen. It's going to crowd uh -huh. out local entrepreneurs producing shampoo because you Local entrepreneurs, natin, we tax them, eh, diba? Our SMEs, we tax them. But now we're allowing FDIs that are market seekers to have the same incentives and zero tax. Those are, you know, th these are things that dapat pinag-iisipan na ng gobyerno ngayon. But I think uh, related to your question kanina, na talaga bang part ng economic reforms na kailangan tutukan ng gobyerno, I think President Marcos actually realized that he's not able to increase foreign direct investment in the country and he's uh, he realized that uh, it's easier to blame the constitution than do the difficult job of improving institution, addressing corruption, improving the energy sector, improving human capital to explain why he's not able to attract foreign investors in the country. Kaya hindi ako naniniwala that this is this is the the solution. There are we I already identified we've enumerated what the government mm -hmm. has to do to be able to attract foreign investment because the economy is open. And yet, they continue to insist that it is the constitution that's the problem. So I think they're finding, looking for a lame excuse for their non-performance. Mm -hmm. Professor, I, I agree. Know, I agree with, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. If tomorrow uh, we declare the entire Philippine economy open for foreign investors, we will continue to have the same bureaucracy you know, that will approve the all of the applications and the investment incentives. You no. Know? Uh, all of the the same bureaucracy in city hall will we will approve the the permits and the same number of signatures you no know, that are required to open a business or secure a mining uh, FTAA or MPSA things like that you no know? so uh, i think in one of the hearings you no know, and it was it was mentioned by uh uh one of the heads of the uh, local investment banks you no know, that we have we don't we cannot neglect you no know, the need to improve the business environment, the business climate, um, making sure that uh, doing business in the Philippines is easy, walang bribes, no? Uh, I mean, if, if one day we say Philippines open to foreign investors, then who, who who's to say na our uh, bureaucrats, our politicians will not exact the same uh, bribes from these investors? Baka, baka yun pa ang motivation, no? 
mas 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 marami pang ba mas marami yeah. bribe <laughs> hmm. Ma- might may i add uh, another concrete example when i was under secretary of DOF uh and lumabas din naman to sa news the japanese firms threatening to leave the country right it's not because of the constitution it's the inefficiency and the reimbursement of bad credit so meaning mm-hmm. the BIR and what has the government done to address the inefficiency in terms of rein- reimbursing tax credit to BIR well, and, and uh, the Japanese threatening to leave the ba? tax administration reform computerization invoicing matagal na sa pipeline yan Professor Magno we're not even talking yet of the high costs of doing business in the Philippines no? like the power yes. power costs mm. low mm. quality of human capital infrastructure mm. no? <laughs> The infrastructure, no? So, oh. they think we have to look at holistically. Ako, uh, ang dami pang pwedeng pag-usapan, uh, <laughs> Dr. Magna, Professor Salvosa. Uh, actually, I, I would want to ask Sana, who, 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 get, who tends to benefit from this? How can we ensure that if the, the uh, economy is opened up, if the economic provisions are revised or amended, how can we be sure that those... Uh, the farmers, those in lower levels of society can actually benefit from these changes from the constitution. But I guess it's a long discussion and I was told we have to move on. So we'll have the call Father Wilmer Tria, uh, the advocacy chair of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines and the president of the Bicol Association of Catholic Schools to react to the presentation of attorney Christian Munson. Father Tria, Father Tria, go ahead. Yes, I'm here, I'm here uh, to attorney uh, Christian Munson, uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a constitutionalist, not an economist, uh, I'm not even the president of the CAP. Uh, Father Albert Delbo just asked me to represent him. So I'm just a a voice or a noise, depending on who is listening to me. Um, first, I like the opening statement of Father of uh, Attorney Christian uh, that EDSA is a work in progress. So our achievement is the 1987 Constitution. Uh, but it's just the bedrock of democracy uh, unless people are empowered. Uh, it's just a work in progress. I mean, uh, there's no real genuine democracy in the country. So I thought authoritarianism is right at the doorsteps, actually, once in a while, it enters our our house. Um, but uh, the real focus is first to preserve the 1987 Constitution while we have the great task, the long-term task of empowering the people um, through economic uh, educational reforms. You know, DepEd's uh, profile of a graduate is that they are equipped with uh, 21st century skills. I said, that's not enough because we are not meant to be workers of the rich countries. We are supposed to be good and responsible citizens. Therefore, the focus must be on uh, critical thinking. Um, democracy is about numbers. So the majority of the Filipino people must really be equipped with critical thinking. So that is one. Second is moral recovery. There's a great gap between faith and justice. So I'm happy to hear that the heart of the constitution is social justice, equal distribution of goods. So if we hear that 80% of the wealth of the country are in the hands or in the pockets of our politicians, then there's no social justice. So again, it's a work in progress. And the last one is uh, livelihood, productivity of the people. So that's my first uh, reaction. Second, um, I also like the final statement of Attorney Monsod. Uh, he said that we overestimated the achievements of EDSA, but we underestimated the greed of our politicians. So to me, uh, to trust that our politicians want to change the constitution for the common good is not only naivety, it's not only mediocrity, but it's uh, it's stupidity. I mean, if you cheat in the elections, if you are elected by the slot machines made in China, 
how can we trust that you are going to work for the common good? So we should remain to be vigilant. All these uh, uh, attempts to amend, like focusing only on uh, education, on, on the economic provision, these are diversionary tactics. So we should not lose sight on the fact that they just want to perpetuate themselves in power. So that's my second. And the last one is about the economic provision, the FDI, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the poison that's ruining our country is begging and shopping. People flock at municipal halls to beg. And then only to hop at city malls to shop. So if that's the activity of the people, then there's no future for our country. Uh, we become a nation of beggars. You know, whenever there's election, uh, people flock at municipal halls to beg. And then the culture of shopping uh, is being promoted through different programs like the four piece, like the extended uh, long weekends, early Christmas bonuses, so that we drain our pockets, so that we go back to our politicians and beg again. So, uh, but we are silent about productivity of our country. We just want to relax the taxation so that we can import products and buy them. But we are not working hard to invest on chemists, on mechanical engineers, so that the cacao that we produce here can be turned into good chocolates. You know, in Switzerland, uh, they have minimal, minimal agricultural window because of the snows, because of the Rocky Alps. And yet, they produce the best chocolates in the, in the world. So we're not a nation of producers. We're just a nation of consumers. So I keep asking my students, why is it that we are one of the poorest countries in the world, but we have the biggest malls in the world? Because we are shoppers. Because we are beggars and shoppers. So that's an illness I see in our country. Uh, and that requires real thinking, real discernment, real reform. Uh, that's all. Those are the three points. Um, all right. Thank you, Father Tria. Attorney Monsad. Mm. All right. Thank you, Father Tria. Now, Attorney Monsad, um, I, I just want to ask, um, what do you make of the fact that um, the so-called People's Initiative that they're doing now, gathering signatures supposedly from the public, um, and there are allegations that this is, in fact, actually being done uh, under the orders of the House Speaker. Um, is it the proper mode for uh, a, a proposal to amend the constitution to be done through a people's initiative, supposedly, and yet the people behind it are actually house make, uh, house uh, house lawmakers, uh, congressmen. Um, is that an abuse of the provision, or is that actually acceptable when you contemplated that particular form of amending the constitution? Do you want an answer from me? Go ahead, go ahead, Attorney Masad. That's for you. Okay, let's put it this way. When I was talking to the people the other day uh, in San Paolo, uh, I was telling them, alam po ninyo, ang tawag dyan, People's Initiative. Ibig sabihin niya, nanggaling sa inyo. Hindi naman ang tawag dyan is Congressman's Initiative. Uh -huh. is kayo. Kayo ang, ang dapat nag-umpisa ito mga ito. Ngunit sinasabi niyo sa akin, na hindi pinapaliwanag sa inyo kung ano talaga ang ibig sabihin na babaguhin o dadagdag yung voting jointly. Eh, alam niyo if you read the case uh, of Santiago case and also the case of Lambino, uh, sinasabi nila na there is no law for, uh, for, a, uh, for a people's initiative to change the constitution. Kasi there are three, right? Plebiscite uh -huh. yung... Uh, People's initiative for okay. national legislation, local legislation, and change uh, and uh, uh, amend the constitution. Sinabi na nung, nung, uh, nung case doon, ang, ang, ang ponente po is si Chief Justice uh, Davide, 
na wala description kung paano mangyayari yung People's Initiative to amend the Constitution. Kasi po, ang dapat, the process should include pinapaliwanag ano ba ang consequences, ano ibig sabihin nito na hindi na ang, ang boto ng Senado ay eh parang isang boto lang ng congressman. Hindi, pina, hindi pinaliliwanag yun sa kanila. Kasi, ibig, eh, malalaman ng tao, teka muna, ang ibig sabihin eh, doon sa Constituent Assembly, eh, uh, total control ang House. Mawala na ang Senate doon, sabi ko. Ganun po ba yun? Oo. Kasi dapat doon, voting separately. Eh, sabi ko, may omission kami doon, doon sa Constitutional Commission, na hindi namin dinagdag yung voting uh, voting separately in three provisions. So one of these is this. The other is um, tax amnesty and amnesty, right? And But over the years, the House and the Senate have accepted that the interpretation should be separate. Kaya yung binundin nila ng, 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 House, ng House yung Constitutional Convention and Constituent Assembly, the implication was voting separately kaya, kaya hindi sila hindi nila na bag, uh, ano na, nagawa yung ginawa you know, nila kaya they resorted to to people's initiative so sabi uh-huh. ko sa mga ah uh, unang-una dapat sabihin sa teka muna po ah uh, kausapin niyo mabuti ang congressman ninyo ah uh, okay magagalit pero kailangan marami kayo because you have the numbers to say na Masama po ba ito ang mangyayari dun sa ating constitution dahil dyan. And that, that's what uh, you should be doing. And because they asked me, how do we change this? Sabi ko, there is one thing that pand- pandemic achieved, which I like. Mm-hmm. The pandemic, what the public pandemic told, told, sh- told us, was showed us, was that many communities solved the problem when those who have the means help those who needed help. Uh-huh. That's like the pan, uh, pantries, right? Community pantries. What does that show us? It showed us that transformation is possible in our country from the bottom up. Tayo lagi ng ilata, sino mang bigay ating presidential candidate? Sino ba ang ating senatorial candidate? Hindi po eh. The solution uh-huh. From the barangay. So sabi ko sa mga, sa mga tao, mga farmers ko, tsaka mga urban poor, you have the numbers of sovereignty. And uh-huh. sovereignty resides in the people. Use that power. Because sinasabi sa atin, the, mo, the, the, way, only way, the best way that you lose power is when you think you love any. You have the numbers. So uh-huh. you choose your people at the barangay then we wait another three years and you choose your people for municipalities, another three years for provinces, and eventually national. And this process, it cannot be done overnight. Kailangan mm-hmm. tayo, tayo, you know, who are intermediaries lang tayo eh. We are intermediaries. And we should, we should always help them, you know, identify, help, and so on. And we should retreat and go back to a different life. Once... There are enough uh, elected officials or appointed officials who come from the poor when they can act for themselves. We are just intermediaries. Sabi ko rin sa church. The church, we need the church for this. In order for the church to help the poor and protect the poor uh, from threats and all that until the poor have control of the of barangays. This is the le- good lesson that was shown to us by the pandemic. The transformation is possible from the bottom up. And that's the only way we can do it when we have a new generation of leaders who come from the poor. That is when we are going to change. And you know, EDSA was, was, was listened by international audience and it brought many of our international TV audience to tears by the nobility uh-huh. of its purpose. Now we have ahead of us the change that we have promised the poor. And there is a way to do it. And that's so, uh, transformation from below until we have a new generation of leaders who come from the poor. 
Mm-hmm. I think we should thank you. Uh, we're, we're still not letting you go. I'm just transitioning to the next part of our uh, forum, which is the Q&A. We have some questions lined up for you. Uh, and let us hear also from our Zoom participants and viewers. If you have questions, either on Facebook or YouTube, you can send your comments online. I will try to read some questions and comments given the limited time we have left. But the first question, uh, Attorney Musun, goes to you. And this is from Francis Magno. Why did the framers leave the creation of an implementing law on people's initiative to Congress and not simply enshrine it in the Constitution without need of an em- enabling law. Well, if we if we if we are going to to put in the Constitution the contents of every abel- enabling law of the principles in the Constitution, you will have ten volumes of uh, of the Constitution. Mm-hmm. That that's precisely the part of Congress. Now that's that's what the same thing that Congress says. Bakit hindi you delegate the Constitution? Kung ano yung relationship no anti-dynasty, two degrees, four degrees, and so on. So, mm-hmm. sa kanila, ganito yun. When we were studying this, some, you know, we, we were discussing it and sabi na, pag nilagay natin sa constitution yan, ngayon, ang kailangan prohibition should be four degrees. What's that? First cousins. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, if we put that, that there is part of the constitution, you need to amend the constitution. If 10 to 15 years old uh, from today, or 20 years old, we have matured enough as a democracy so mm-hmm. that we only need two degrees. And if 30 years, we, we also have matured some more, we may not even need it. That's why we mm-hmm. said, why don't, why, the, because Congress keeps on telling us, uh, we, we need to change the constitution because uh, it doesn't know. It doesn't adjust to circumstances. It's not resilient enough. And here we are with a provision in the Constitution for anti-dynasty, and they have sat on it for thirty-six years. The another mm-hmm. one that uh, that I'd like to b- bring up is that your know, party system, unfortunately, mm-hmm. two bad decisions of the Supreme Court. That the the party system is a is a proportional representation. It is not mm-hmm. or exclusive to those economic economically poor. It is an implementation implementation of social justice provision of of uh, addressing inequality not only in economic but in social and political inequalities. And this is part of mm-hmm. that. I mean, no, that we have a lot of. People who say they know have ideology for a better Philippines and so on. Why don't we give them a chance to be heard in Congress? Uh-huh. Let be the place where we can hear all of the alternatives available to us. But meron lang reserves for nine conse- nine years, three consecutive. Na meron uh-huh. for marginalized inter- nakalagay dun yung mga, mga areas, no. But after that, it must be proportional representative we only uh, need three, we only need three amendments to the party system that is not be, that is now being abused by politicians three number two number one uh, anti dynasty provision number two remove the limit of three this is proportional uh-huh. representation a uh-huh. group earns enough votes for six or seven representatives and you give them only three where do you give the other votes? Today, the committee gives the other votes to other to other party lists, even mm-hmm. if the ideology is different from who they voted for. So take out that limit. If they are entitled to seven, give them seven representatives. And number, number three amendment, there is a phrase in the law that says that the candidates must be organic or members of the group. An exception is they have a track record of of advocacy for the group. Palusot uh-huh. yun. Palusot. Uh-huh. Yeah, in fact, Justice Castro said, I, I see Justice uh, Tony Capio said, we cannot legislate, but this must be changed by legislation. Kasi uh-huh. what a, a, a resident of Forbes Park, the uh, son of a president, represented tricycle drivers. That is not part of the system. So mm-hmm. with these three provisions, we can change. We can change the quality of the elections, both the quality of the process 
and the quality of the boat. Not uh -huh. quality. What about what about doing about the warlords? We already were told in in, nine, in two three years ago that that twenty new uh, 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 armed groups in the Philippines in Mindanao, right? There are two million uh, are, uh, arms that are not licensed. What is the PNP doing about this? So that we don't have the use of money, the use of force that devalues the quality of the vote of the poor, particularly. They're the majority in our country, right? They will not vote. They will not vote but, uh, for for people who are, who are, who are uh, uh, what do you call it, warlords and so on. But they have no choice. Uh -huh. They have poor choices. We have to give them more choices by taking away all of these restrictions that devalue the quality of the voting elections. We have so many yeah. things more that we can do on legislation. I'm telling the, the, the Congress, what, what are you doing changing the Constitution? And it's even not very meaningful for those three areas. Why don't you, why don't you legislate a anti-dynasty provision? Why don't you amend the party list system? Why don't you amend the mining law? There are so many things that can be done by them. And what are they uh -huh. to change the constitution in order that they can have more power? When you shift to parliamentary system, they combine the executive and the legislature, correct? That gives uh -huh. them more. And then the the the, uh, the prime minister has no limit on his term. He's elected by parliament and not by the people. And that's what I'm told that they'll be doing in uh, if they have once they get the chance once they get the chance to change more of the constitution right i have a long list mm -hmm. if you look at the list of the house uh, right this is uh -huh. not the place to do it but i have a long list uh -huh. of what they have to do with the new constitution and we must not allow this uh, this charter change to take place attorney monsad um a couple of questions here um, I guess some of which uh, you've already answered. Um, one from a PCS member. Um, you said earlier that the constitution is not perfect. Which provisions need amendment and what is the legal way? I believe you have answered some of the questions, but his question is, what is the legal way? And I'll just wrap this with another question uh, asking if you would question uh, Chacha before the Supreme Court, if you think uh, that's not legal. Go ahead. Yes. Attorney. Of course, you will question the Supreme Court on constitutionality. And, and of course, what's happening at the top within the four before dynastic families, there seem to be all kinds of disagreements and so on. And one of the factors here is how will the Supreme Court decide and who has the influence in the Supreme Court, correct? Right? So I, I, I think that uh, we will go anyway because... When we when we fought against Sigaw Nambayan of of, uh, of of Arroyo, we were told, Chris, you know, why are you filing this? Out mm -hmm. of the justices, 10 were appointed by Arroyo. Well, you have no chance. Well, we won. We had an 8-7 mm -hmm. to seven vote, and Arroyo's appointees voted 5-5. Five and, five. Mm -hmm. and and when we went after a Shendero Visita, they said, no, empowers, you know, Pinoy Nanjan. Well, when we won that case for the farmers, 13-0 in favor of the farmers. My point is, there are golden moments in the Supreme Court. And let us pray. And if you have connections, let us try to influence and tell the justices. You, you know, we are taught in law school. Legislature is the purse. The uh, executive is the sword. And the Supreme Court is the conscience of the nation. Mm -hmm. And, the, and their claim to legitimacy is their independence because they are uh, appointed people. Those are elected. The source of legitimacy is the vote of the people. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Unelected and appointed, their source of legitimacy is their independence. Attorney Monson, uh, there's another question from uh, Mr. Joseph Solis uh, from the chat. Would it be more beneficial to our country to completely remove foreign equity ownership restrictions altogether from the Constitution to assure the irreversibility of FDI liberalization laws that would allow our country to forge uh, FTAs with the European Union, Mercosur, 
uh, Pacific Alliance and the United States, or perhaps join USCMA, US, Canada, and Mexico. What do you think of that? Actually, our economy is open. I, I'm surprised. I mean, I, 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 it does already mention all of these things. Land uh -huh. can, natural resources is possible under Article 12, Section 2 of the Constitution. Well, utilities already open, not only telecommunications, but transportation. Mm -hmm. Transportation, because one of the problems in our country is the cost of of uh, of bringing goods from the sun to the Visayas. That somebody somebody is even cheaper to go from Manila to Singapore and to Visayas than direct. Now that can open that's open now to foreign ownership. So mm -hmm. as far as I can see, today the 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 the, cons the constitution has proven to be resilient with you know and and has adjusted mm -hmm. to the uh so they're wrong when they said that you know it's stuck there and no laws have been passed uh uh you know I, i'd like to mention on on uh on uh, uh energy one of the problems they say is the cost of energy and yet that's allowed 100% to foreigners. My experience, because I was at Miracle, right, is that when you negotiate with these foreign investors, 100% is theirs. They still would not invest until they get get a uh, take or pay provision from Miracle for, say, 20 years, 15, that you take a certain volume from them, regardless of whether you use it or not. And that's mm -hmm. why part of the high cost of electricity in this country. It has nothing to do with the Constitution because the Constitution allows 100% ownership for power generation. All right. Thank you, Attorney Monsoud. Um, very, very quickly, I know we're supposed to wrap up, but I can see Dr. Magnus smiling there earlier. And there's this very quick question. Um, allowing foreigners to become freehold legal landowners would make marrying Filipino na nationals unnecessary to circumvent the ban. The ban. 25-year lease lands cannot be more mortgageable. What do you think of this argument that you will allow foreigners so that they don't circumvent the law? That's 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 you know that's part of, part of the law. But I I do think that's a major major problem in our country. That is not uh -huh. it's not a, that is not a reason to amend a, a constitutional provision. During uh -huh. the hearings, in one of the earlier hearings, the foreign chambers of commerce admitted that if land is allowed to be owned by, by, uh, by foreigners in our country, the price of the land can, as out, will, will be out of the reach of the poor. This is from uh -huh. the foreign chambers of commerce. Uh -huh. Eating that. And yet, some of our congressmen want to change it want to, for what i think it's all about as i said mentioned earlier it's all about transactional legislation where where our our congressmen thrive you know and uh -huh. bar, for example if you listen to the pids study of person man and son part of the problem is that the money that's get, that's supposed to go to the lgus uh are instead uh, put at the, at the at the control of the department of the, the budget, and those department of the budget uh, work with the congressman on how to spend those money, particularly infrastructure. That is the source, part of the source of pork barrel, and mm -hmm. all you need to do is amend section seventeen of the omnibus of of the of, uh, local government code. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Attorney Monsoud. Final word, uh, Dr. Magno, very quickly before we go. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mike. Good as a final word. I, um, I do not agree that we need to amend the Constitution now, particularly on the economic issues. We've already summarized that our economy is very open and we've identified very specific concerns to ensure that we are able to attract foreign uh, investment in the country. I think the president should focus its energy in doing and solving the real problems of the country. All right. And final word from Dr. Franco. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, no constitution, I think, is perfect, as we discussed uh, today. But this does not mean that some people can just hijack its being imperfect just to serve their ends. I have no problems with changing or revising the economic provisions of the constitution, except that I do not see compelling evidence to change them. Thank you. All right. 
on that note, we are over time right now. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for sharing your insights, Dr. Jean and Sinas Franco, Dr. Shello Magno, Attorney Christian Monsod, and our reactors, Dr. John Robert Go, Professor Felipe Salvosa III, and Father William Tria. Now, we now proceed to a synthesis uh, and closing remarks to be delivered by the President of the Philippines Communication Society, Dr. Elena Pernia. Dr. Pernia? Hello and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, you know, there are several dates in February that are dear to us. February 14 is Valentine's Day. February 22 to 25 are the dates we Filipinos commemorate as People Power or EDSA Revolution. Never mind that this year it was delisted as a holiday. February 2 is Constitution Day, a proclamation made by then President Corazon Aquino commemorating the ratification of the 1987 Constitution, which restored this democracy in the Philippines. So today's roundtable on cha-cha-cha, mga indayog at ritmo sa pagpalit ng saligang batas, is very timely this penultimate day of February 2024, for we talked about the Constitution, people power, and all underscored but by our love for country. For some time now, the charter change debate has filled our news media. Advocates for charter change cite the urgent need to amend provisions, particularly the restrictive economic provisions. Meanwhile, those who oppose charter change suspect that these campaigns are mere attempts to perpetuate themselves in power. As pointed out earlier, this is not the first attempt to change the 1987 Constitution, as all administrations after President Corazon Aquino have proposed changes to it. Today's roundtable discussion is our contribution to deepen the students and general public's knowledge about the current issues that affect our lives. Our webinar began with the welcome remarks of PCS Vice President and Ateneo de Manila University faculty, Leonora Hernando. She touched on the mission of PCS, specifically the relevance and importance of discussing the Constitution to our democracy. Our very able moderator, lawyer, and multi-awarded journalist, Mike Navalio, engaged our panelists in dynamic conversation. His in-depth comments and questions steered this exciting discussion. From Professor Jean Encinas Franco, uh, a member of the faculty of, the, of UP Diliman's Political Science Department and member of the Philippine Political Science Association, cited from the, their position paper. And she pointed out, among other things, that one, historically, Philippine initiatives to change uh, the constitution have been were, were made to break from immediate past and usher in a new political order. The problems that the Charter Revision wishes to address cannot be done through constitutional amendment, regular legislation, or executive action. The claim that there is public clamor for constitutional change remains unsubstantiated. Constitutional change is not the, the silver bullet to cure our problems, and current developments show that charter change is a done deal, so that those who oppose the charter change must speak and act now. With reference to the charter change to, en to enable our country's economic resurgence, Professor Shello Magno of the UP School of Economics educated us on the benefits and limits of foreign direct investments and current policies on foreign, foreign investment. While FDIs may foster economic expansion, create new jobs, and enable knowledge and tech transfer, they are not also bullet. Even with FDI growth, uh, even with FDIs, growth cannot always be expected. Importantly, uh, former finance USEC Magno pointed out that Congress in 2022 already addressed restrictive provisions, citing as examples the current policy on mining, provision for land for use of land, amendments of the Foreign Investment Act. Our economy, she said, is already very open. 
Meanwhile, lawyer Christian Monsod, who was one of the framers of the 1987 Constitution, spoke beautifully about the importance of the Constitution and what should be done to amend it. He noted he noted the importance of talking about the Constitution as 73% of our people know nothing or very little of it. EDSA, he said, was the inspiration of the 1987 Constitution, which had three central th themes. One, the heart of the, of the Constitution is social justice, with the poor as the center of our development. Second, never again to any authority authoritarian government. And third, the national destiny must firmly and safely rest on Filipinos themselves. He warned that we are on a slippery slope to authoritarianism under a dynastic political system. And he lamented that the 1987 CONCOM's mistake was to overestimate the spirit of EDSA and underestimate the greed of our politicians. From our resource persons and reactors, there is an apparent consensus that charter change should not be left to the Congress. President of the Philippine Political Science Association and UP policy professor, Dr. Go, called the constitution a written, a written institution where the people must have a hand in what and how to change it. Dr. Goh stressed that the Constitution is just one part of the equation to progress as the human factor, both its positive and negative characteristics and consequences comprises the other parts of the equation. Professor Felipe Salvosa II, head of the UST journalism program and PCS director, quoted an adage saying that changing the constitution is too important to leave to the politicians. Professor Salvosa agreed with Dr. Magno that the social that the so-called economic amendments should not be taken as pure and good. Among other things, the people need to appreciate the premises of economic proposals. Father Wilmer Tria, CIAP Advocacy Chair and President of the Bicol Association of Catholic Schools, agreed that Philippine democracy is a work in progress. He also said that with authoritarianism at our doorstep, it is important to preserve the 1987 uh, Constitution while at the same time, improve long-term mechanisms to empower people. One way is through education, which should create learning environments that allow critical thinking. The discussion was extremely rich, and this th synthesis has not adequately captured all the points brought out. So I invite you to re-watch this webinar, which is available on the PCS Facebook page, the TVUP website, as well as the YouTube channel of TVUP. This will also be shown on the TVUP channel, Signal 101. Ibalita na rin nyo sa inyong mga kaklase, kaibigan, kapamilya para sa patuloy nating pagmumulat. This webinar is in line with the PCS's mission to generate knowledge on current issues and to champion social justice. I wish to acknowledge my co-directors of the PCS board with a special mention of Professor Flor Delis Abanto, who set this into motion. And to TVUP, our thanks for making this webinar an important educational resource. Inaanyayahan ko kayong lahat na maging miyembro ng PCS. Sana po'y bisitahin niyo ang website namin sa www.filscomsoc.org kung saan nakalahad ang iba't iba naming mga proyekto at programa at ang mga benepisyo para sa mga miyembro. Muli, isang malaking pasasalamat. And thank you so much, Dr. Pernia, and I look forward to more enlightening discourses on pressing issues beyond sound bites and quote cards. And I personally commend the people behind this uh, because this is a chance for uh, the academics, people in the academe, to go beyond the so-called ivory tower and reach out to the masses, especially through platforms like this on YouTube, Facebook, or through uh, a TV channel even on, on cable to be able to discuss pressing issues. And, and my wish is that People will, will talk more about this. Now, uh, Chacha will always be there for as long as there are people in power who want to extend their term, who have different motivations. That will always be an option. 
And thus, it's always important for people to ask, ano ba ang motivation? Bakit ba magcha-cha-cha? Anong papalitan? Sino mag-benefit? Tayo ba ay uunlad yung kinabukasan natin kapag binago ang konstitusyon? At ang tanong, ang konstitusyon ba? Ang salingang batas ba? Ang may problema? O tayo na nagpapatupad nito? Kung sinong nakaupo sa pwesto? So friends, this has been Cha-Cha-Cha, mga indayog at ritmo sa pagpapalit ng saligang batas. And I am Attorney Mike Navalio, greeting you all a pleasant afternoon. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone.